Hey there, welcome to Over the Horizon. You know, here on this channel, on this podcast, I like to look at technologies that appear to be maturing, appear just over the horizon, ready for deployment, ready to impact our lives, ready to intersect with various aspects of the global economy, of uh, global supply chains, of global security and geopolitics. And today, this episode, we're going to talk about one such new and exciting technology that so far has been within the realm of science fiction. I'm talking about lasers. And why are we talking about lasers? Well, the Congressional Research Service submitted a report in the in the end of January uh, talking about Navy shipboard lasers. Uh, they briefed Congress on uh, some very interesting aspects as, as per the needs for shipboard lasers, uh, the importance of having this technology for defense, not only of naval assets, but also land assets, and the cost effectiveness. They called it the cost exchange ratio. And I have with me today Lieutenant Colonel uh, Paul Lushenko, he's uh, a colonel, a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. He's the director of special operations and a faculty instructor at the U.S. Army War College. He's, he wears many hats, and I'm going to run through all of them. He's a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a senior fellow at the Cornell Brooks School Tech Policy Institute, which he, in fact, helped establish as the founding executive director. He's an adjunct research lecturer at the Charles Stewart University in Canberra, Australia. He is the co-editor of uh, Drones and Global Order, Implications of Remote Warfare for International Society. And his latest book is one that he's co-authored. It's just out, uh, and it's titled The Legitimacy of Drone Warfare, Evaluating Public Perceptions. That's many, many hats. This is the second time I have him here on Over the Horizon with me. Thank you for your time, Paul. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. We'll we'll have to start speaking in acronyms, uh, which is part of the course for the U.S. Army. Pleasure to be here and talk about these important issues with you and your audience. All right. So laser weapons for defense. Are we talking about science fiction or perhaps a little bit of reality there? Because this congressional uh, research report uh, is really, really interesting. It talks about the need for these weapons. It talks about the very important aspect of just how cost effective these are. And there's one particular term, which is the cost exchange ratio. What does this mean? Yeah, so first and foremost, uh, you know, several decades ago, going back to President Reagan's initiative for Star Wars, which is the use of lasers for defense against ballistic missiles, of course, is with the height of the Cold War. We were attempting to buy down the risk of an exchange of nuclear weapons from the former Soviet Union. I would have said that this was fantasy. In fact, this capability that was envisioned by President Reagan never actually got off the ground, uh, literally and, and figuratively. But yet the technology has advanced so much in terms of form factor, as well as in terms of cost and what we call swipe, swap, rather, which is about the amount of power uh, that you can bring to bear for uh, a very effective uh, laser that we are really talking about something that is not too far off or over the horizon the namesake of this podcast now back to the cost exchange ratio this is really an appealing advantage for especially non-state actors or smaller countries that are contending with more capacious militaries so think hamas uh, think the houthis uh, think, uh, indeed, Ukraine, which has adopted a variable army of drones against Russia, which is a, a larger military, that they would be able to use a capability like a drone, like a laser in this case, uh, which is inexpensive, uh, and result in a force protection countermeasure like a large-scale missile that would otherwise be used to take out another missile. And so the cost exchange ratio talks about the asymmetry uh, that we're attempting to collapse in terms of U.S. countermeasures. We no longer want to be employing a, a missile against a drone, expending a million dollar missile, if not more, against a capability that cost at most a couple thousand dollars. And this is the same sense with lasers that you could capitalize on a relatively inexpensive, but highly effective and point uh, sort of defense system uh, to take off or take out rather 
uh, a capability uh, which is relatively inexpensive and cheap to build and use. All right. So laser weapons exist. They're part of reality. And here's a very interesting clip I want to play out. This, I believe, is from 2022. This is the US Navy testing out a laser weapon. Amazing. This is reality now. We're talking about this. Not many people realize that this exists and the fact that it is deployed and is deployed on the USS Portland, I believe. Yeah, and so what we're seeing here is an advancement over time of testing uh, these capabilities because not a lot of people understand the sort of challenges of operating on the maritime domain. Uh, we call it sea states and there are various degrees of sea state. And so that particular sea state looked fairly steady uh, in terms of the water, in terms of the pitch and roll of the boat. But the fact of the matter is to be able to actually employ this uh, what we call solid state directed energy laser against a mobile non-stationary capability in the aerial domain is, is quite a feat. And that takes considerations, again, of power to this laser that is being drawn from a boat, which is alone and unafraid uh, in the middle of the ocean potentially, uh, and also is required to um, enable other systems such as radar for mm -hmm. uh, detection tracking purposes, but also life support systems to include communications, to include heat, to include uh, other sort of, uh, of capabilities. And so, yes, we're at the point where these are becoming much more reality rather than science fiction. Yeah. Okay. But before we progress, um, explain th there are there are limitations here. Uh, and the limitations are to do with the very environment and the circumstances yeah. in which these lasers are deployed here that's on right. Earth for now. Um, there's a possibility that they could be deployed in space, and that's exciting, and we talk about that a bit later, but let's start here on Earth. You have something called atmospheric disturbance, interference. And when you talk about laser weapons, you also have to talk about the challenges of beam control, beam direction. And also the energy that is deployed on the target yep. at uh, in a sustained manner. Now, right. we've known that laser weapons of the capacity of 100 kilowatts, even 150 kilowatts uh, have been deployed. And I think the one that we've seen here on the USS Portland uh, is about 150 kilowatt, if I'm not mistaken. What are the challenges in the real world application and deployments of this? So I think you've mentioned several of those, right? So first, in, in terms of the state or conditions of the environment here in the maritime domain, we talked about sea states, right? And that has implications for your tracking, uh, targeting, locating, and ultimately a solution. In this case, the pulsing of a directed energy uh, weapon system to disable, disorient, uh, take out, uh, for lack of a better term, um, a drone. The other consideration as well is the climatology, right? And so if we were on the sort of land domain uh, and these lasers can be employed on land domain, that's things such as water, things such as cloud, persistent cloud cover, uh, perspiration in the air to include, um, or precipitation rather, rain, snow, uh, moisture, uh, condensation, condensation, things of that nature. And so that will also um, figure into the ability of a laser to acquire target, maintain the target, and to apply uh, an effect. The other consideration as well, which is also environmental, especially when you're expeditionary uh, in a deployed expeditionary environment, is the amount of power you have. Again, I've called this swap, the ability to energize a later, uh, laser uh, deliberately, right, directly, but also uh, understanding the trade-offs for other systems that you actually may need to employ that weapon system. And so the dependencies um, for a laser across the breadth of a capability equipment that you have are really important to understand. And it's always a consideration when you're building um, capability. So by a way of example, if this is not clear enough already, when I was at the Pentagon, we were building what we call the terrestrial layer system, which is the next generation combat vehicle that incorporates signals intelligence, electronic warfare, and cyber effects. And we wanted it to field us to do everything uh, all at once at what we call the tactical edge, which is the, the furthest sort of uh, point that we can actually touch feel uh, by way of radar or even physically 
uh, an adversary. The real challenge in building this capability was swap, that in providing signals intelligence capability, you may take away power for active electronic warfare capabilities. And the same thing is consistent with what's happening with these lasers. And so if you dig into the Congressional Research Services report like you have, like I have, and other interested experts, what you'll find is that SWAP is becoming a real Achilles heel for these lasers in the maritime domain. Absolutely. And uh, I think it's also important to, uh, to point out here that because of the fact that um, you have problems with beam control and concentrating the laser beam and reducing beam scattering, you have to deploy these weapons also at a particular distance from the target, right? So their reach or their range is not as much as, let's say, um, counter-missile capabilities and counter-missile systems, right. weapon systems. So explain this, break this down for us. Yeah, that's a really great point, right? And so ultimately what you're doing, especially in a maritime environment, and let's just talk about, let's say, the South China Sea, or other contested international water ranges, uh, waterways, is you're attempting to capitalize on the radar distance that you have, right? the distance that you can use your radars to sense, collect information about an adversary's formation, their tempo, um, whatever. You want to use that then to echelon what we call lethal or non-lethal fire, so something like electronic warfare or a missile. The challenge with these lasers even given the appeal for low cost is that they do have short operational reach, the distance at which you can actually fire or pulse them and have some debilitating effect for an adversary's capability. And so when you start talking about the way that you can integrate these lasers into a force protection plan, whether on land, sea, or air, or how you can use them in an offensive manner, you have to start thinking about the echelonment of this fire. And so it seems to me, based upon where we're at in terms of these lasers, the power required to use them, mm -hmm. that you're not going to get much more than several kilometers up to, you know, 10 or 50 kilometer, kilometers at that based upon the sort of, uh, of distances here. And, and actually probably may be an embellishment of the distances that we're talking about right now. Yeah. Yeah. So that inherently makes it easier to deploy these on land, perhaps? because it's easier to get that sort of power um, and the infrastructure to deliver that sort of power to these weapons on land than it would be on sea. And of course, the most difficult would be on airborne platforms. Yeah, I think you're absolutely cor correct because swap power becomes a, a consideration. And so there's actually a, an interesting intersection, and we were talking about this beforehand, um, with what took place recently uh, in Jordan with the use of an Iranian-backed uh, militias, uh, use of, of a drone by an Iranian-backed militia to kill these uh, three U.S. soldiers. And in this case, what you see clearly in the reporting, and you can take a look at a Washington Post report uh, that I was just quoted in, a, a really good story that talks about the force protection measures or lack thereof. There was not really many active or passive force protection measures at this compound based upon a fairly reasonable threat assessment that led intelligence officials to believe that the most likely threats in terms of drones were going to be levied against larger scale compounds in Iraq and Syria. And so this mm -hmm. particular compound in Jordan was more optimized for land based threats. But had we thought that there were going to be Iranian drones thrown uh, at this location, you could conceivably use these lasers in addition to more classical or, or traditional what we call short range or SHORAD capabilities like a sea whiz machine gun uh, or other sort of arresting nets. And so I think that there's real promise for these lasers that for the most part are being um, tested, fielded, experimented on, on the maritime domain in concert with maritime capabilities uh, ashore uh, for land-based platforms and expeditionary outposts like Tower 22 in Jordan. All right. So we see an immediate need for this, but it seems that the U.S., um, at least if you read this report, it appears as if uh, America is just waking up to the need for this. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? They seem to have been, these weapons seem to have been in, de in de development for quite a few years. Deployment on ships for trials uh, and exploratory trials would have begun, I believe, in sometime around 2014, 2015. But there seems to be a sense of urgency now. And... Are, is, are you are you saying that it is incidents like 
the attack on Tower 22 in Jordan, uh, lessons learned from the war in Ukraine, lessons here learned from the war in Gaza. Has this really jolted uh, the U.S. Congress into realizing that this is urgent? We need this now. Well, I certainly hope so, right? And there's a saying in operational art and design which explains the conceptual tools that planners use to synchronize capabilities and time, space, and force to achieve objectives militarily that support political aims. There's a saying called, it goes slow until it goes fast, right? And so I think what you're seeing right now is one, an enduring understanding of the asymmetry that drones and other low cost systems can provide a smaller, uh, even non-state, especially non-state actor vis-a-vis a a larger military, right? There's been this enduring understanding um, and we've known this for, for many decades, right? But what we're seeing right now is that the vulnerability imposed because of drones and low cost systems at that in terms of dead soldiers, given the deployments that the United States military and our allies and partners have abroad for global security purposes really creates a key vulnerability. And so I think that it's important that Congress continue to spend money and indeed increase allocations and apportionments of money to experiment test and feel these capabilities. And so if you take a look at the history surrounding these lasers, there's a couple key themes that are quite troubling for me as an expert on emerging technologies and its implications for war. The first is the amount of money, again, notwithstanding this mammoth bill that we had with the Star Wars system during the Reagan uh, administration, the amount of money that we're spending on these lasers, solid state, dazzling, whatever they may be, is actually pennies compared to the broader DOD uh, budget, Department of Defense budget, which is in terms of the millions and, and billions and trillions, right? The second sort of consideration would be, whereas you would want continuity of development over time that gives you feedback from testing, prototyping, especially uh, when used by soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, what you see in the literature and in this report we've referenced earlier is kind of a fits and start for capability development. So a contractor, Northrop Grumman, uh, Lockheed Martin, whatever, these large scale um, contractors put in a bid, uh, they get a contract, meaning they get you know money uh, to fill the capability uh, as well as profit. Uh, they, they produce a capability. It, it may be put into a ship for a little bit, but then it's extracted and it goes into uh, an ashore sort of assignment for further testing and calibra- calibration of these uh, follow on lasers. And so what we don't have right now is a real programmatic approach, as far as I can tell, to off um, or retrofitting rather our, our ships as they come out of production um, with this, um, this laser system. And, and that's kind of problematic. Uh, and the same thing is true, I believe, of what's happening in the land domain, where as we start to deploy these systems, um, we'll start to deploy these systems more in expeditionary environments, because we know that they can be integrated in echelon with existing systems as well to protect our soldiers. Right, and I, of course, I suppose the longer these um, these this these uh, periods of experimental uh, analysis go on, the more money there is to be paid. Well, that's it, true. I mean, that's true as well. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that, one, this is really tough business, right? I mean, the acquisitions process is just not yeah. optimized for yeah. rapid prototyping like it is in Ukraine. And certainly we're not in an yeah. existential threat of war, right? Yeah. But having said that, what I see consistently, which is quite frustrating, is a realization among policy observers, people who make policy, people who are decision makers, have the power of the purse, both in Congress, but also the Department of Defense, for just how frustrated and troublesome the system is. But we don't seem to be updating or changing it as rapidly as we all recognize we should. Yeah. You know, there's a saying, the less, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's true for policy as well. It's not just for soldiers. It's also for the lawmakers. Um, All right. Since we're talking about costs, uh, it's very interesting that um, the Israelis claim and this is a report from Reuters in uh, 2022, as far as back as 2022, that their laser missile shield, which they call the iron beam, costs just $2 a pop. Uh, I believe uh, it's in the vicinity of about $10 a pop for the American systems uh, offered by Lockheed Martin. So there is a massive 
um, cost savings here. And it is that cost saving that really is the game changer, right? Because as we've seen um, with the war in Gaza and the thousands of missiles fired by the Hamas into Israel, each of those uh, missiles for the Israeli um, Iron Dome system costs, what, roughly around $40,000, if I've got my numbers right. Uh, if you replace that with $2 per pop, that is a massive game changer, isn't it? Yeah, This again, it reduces the sort of cost exchange ratio that you've called to a much more manageable level than firing a million to $10 million missile against a $1,000 uh, drone that you know takes to produce that. I, I think this is a really good observation you make. On the other hand, I wonder if there's this uh, consideration of economy of scales between the United States, which has a much larger population than Israel, and then furthermore, the volume of capability that Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and other contractors have to build, the scope of capability, in other words, outfitting uh, existing capabilities across all different domains, um, right? And also on top of that, the sort of global responsibilities that the United States has. And then furthermore, what we call systems integration. And so each service, as well as the joint chiefs of staff, uh, at the Pentagon, we'll have a dedicated staff section that deals with what we call capability uh, integration. And what this is designed to do is take a look at the current inventory of capability um, across domain of operation, and then determine how we can build or acquire new capability that tacks onto that, retrofitting it, and then furthermore, how it interoperates with existing capabilities, not just within one service, but across all services. And this is really the graduate level of war fighting, which is to say joint combines arms maneuver. And because of the depth and breadth of US responsibilities, how big our military is compared to Israel's, I think that what you're seeing there is a reflection of the cost that it would take one of these contractors to build. And then furthermore, these defense contractors have employees, uh, they have, you know, marketing requirements, uh, they have experimentation development requirements. And so all that's probably baked into, as far as I can tell, the increased cost uh, relative to Israeli cost on firing a pulse uh, for one of these intercepts. If you look at uh, the two main wars that we're a witness to in the world right now, there are so many lessons to be learned. The, the war... Um, in Ukraine has just transformed our understanding of the importance of drone warfare and counter drone measures, uh, but also artificial intelligence and the deployment of artificial intelligence in the war in Gaza. Uh, we're seeing the, uh, you know, we're, we're take, there are huge takeaways, uh, both from the war in Gaza as well as uh, Ukraine for the deployment of uh, AI for uh, what is uh, ISR intelligence, uh, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So we're, we're seeing the dawn of new technologies. Um, and this is transforming the battlefield. It is transforming um, the approach, uh, the, the, the tactics uh, and approach and the game plan. And it's I find it very fascinating that President Zelensky announced uh, that the Ukrainian military would create a separate branch dedicated to drones, a directorate of drones. That just goes to show how fast um, the battlefield is changing and how fast governments need and militaries need to adopt uh, new, new methods, new standards to adapt to this changing battlefield in order to not only survive, but also prevail. Yeah, I think that's right. And of course, Ukraine is an incubator for military innovation, and it's been out of necessity as well. And we've seen that across the course of military history and these key battles, these key conflicts that militaries uh, have been forced to innovate uh, lest, uh, you know, they are defeated or not as successful in terms of war termination uh, and what this means uh, going forward. I will say, on the other hand, that I, I think your assessment's correct, and I think that people who share it are correct, that these capabilities, AI, drones, lasers, will have indelible implications for the, the, the character of warfare, how we employ tools uh, pursuant to the use of military force for political and military objectives. On the other hand, and I'm writing about this right now in a forthcoming piece for what we call the conversation, which is this form of explanatory journalism, and I'm happy to share it to you and, and your audience members, I think we really have to be really careful about not making a mountain out of a molehill here, right? Because as I take a step back with my expertise in research in this area of drones, especially in those that are AI enabled as well, 
what I see clearly is that drones have had tactical level effects, right? They have been very effective, especially the first person view drones uh, for killing, let's say, in the context of the Ukraine war, Russian up armored vehicles and, and tanks. In fact, drones were principally used to block and defeat the large convoy, as you remember, at the start of the war from Chernobyl down to Kiev. I mean, this was based upon a specialized unit of drone operators. When we start to ratchet up to the operational level where planners will synchronize battles and skirmishes to achieve you know, overall military objectives, drones have been much less effective, right? So what we haven't seen are drones dislodging Russia from these World War I style trenches. In fact, drones have potentially reinforced the importance of defensive operations, not offensive operations. And Steve Biddell talks about this a lot in a recent series of pieces in foreign affairs. He's at Columbia University. He used to be a professor here at the US Army War College. And then furthermore, when you ratchet up to the strategic level, which talks in terms of war termination and the offense defense balance that goes into war for uh, war termination, drones have, have been much less uh, successful. And so the notion that drones are a magic bullet, that they are changing the, the uh, fate of nations is really a, an embellishment of drones. And I think conflating drones to the tactical level. For the most part, where drones have been successful strategically has been in terms of psychological implications, right? So both Ukraine and Russia have used drones to reinforce the resiliency, the resolve of their populations. They have a propaganda value, but on the other hand, to terrorize the citizens of their opposing nation, right? So yeah. I think your your assessment is absolutely correct when we talk in terms of sort of the tactical, maybe operational considerations, but strategically, really warfare is about combined arm maneuver and trying to impose multiple dilemmas. And you can do that through drones, but it really requires a bringing to bear of, of multiple capabilities. Yes, indeed. And then when you see something like this, you yep. can't ignore the importance of drones. Taking well, you down can't. a Russian Corvette. No, no, you can't do that, right? And so this goes back to the operational level of warfare, right? And so uh, Eric Schmidt recently wrote a piece um, in the Foreign uh, Affairs where he, he said that Ukrainian officials claim to not just have killed the Russian flagship cruiser uh, about a year Moscow. ago now yep, in, in the Black Sea, but something hmm. like 15 additional ships, right? Yeah, and if that's yeah. the case, what it's done is it's kind of undermined Ukraine's ability to impose a, impose a blockade uh, in uh, Crimea there and you know reduce the amount of wheat uh, exports, which has global implications. And then furthermore, yeah. reduce the ability of Russia to resupply uh, soldiers on, on the front lines. And this is in addition to using a drone against an important bridge, a land bridge, as it were, between Russia and Russia-controlled uh, Crimea. But, but still, what we see is that drones haven't been enough to overcome uh, the sort of reinforcement and, and innovation on, be, on behalf of, of Russia. And so I think, anyway, that they have been very, very important yeah. tactically, to a degree operationally, strategically. Uh, they leave something to be desired at this point. All right. So it's not just um, the Israelis uh, who claim to have used uh, and deployed their iron beam, actually. Um, it's uh, not just the Americans who are looking at it. The Brits are looking at it as well and uh, trust the Brits to come up with a name like Dragonfire. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, but but it's it seems a very, very um, impressed with the capabilities. And I have a quote here from, um, this is uh, Grant Shap, the Defense Secretary, saying this type of cutting edge weaponry has the potential to revolutionize the battle space by reducing the reliance on expensive ammunition and also lowering the risk of collateral damage. And investments with industry partners in advanced technologies like Dragonfire are crucial in a highly contested world, helping us maintain the battle-winning edge and keeping the nation safe. So this very much, the laser weapons are very much front and center of um, almost every major world power and almost every major um, military in the world, be it for land, sea, or air deployment. Yeah, that's um, right. It's interesting to see how, um, you know, the West uh, is focusing on this. What about China? And how does this play out uh, in, in the West versus China, in America versus China? Yeah, so I don't disagree with the general officer there. I mean, this is the theoretical expectation, which has resulted in some gains recently in terms of capability development. 
that we think will buy down the sort of cost exchange uh, ratio. And by the way, it's important, right? So take a look at the operations in the Indo-Asian Pacific. One of the vulnerabilities, which is well established and talked about a lot in open source reporting is this notion of magazine depth, resupply mm -hmm. um, of ammunition, especially. And, and, and yeah. that is a harrowing task as it is <laughs> literally in the high seas in yeah. a critical vulnerability that adversaries are aware of. And so this is quite revolutionary uh, if we can get it right. I have no doubt, although I haven't delved into this as much, in terms of the cross-national development of these capabilities for uh, China and for Russia. What we know in terms of the intellectual property space is that there is such innovation in the United States where the best uh, engineering sort of universities um, in the world to the degree that foreign students come to the United States, MIT, Cornell and elsewhere, and then go home and start businesses, right? So what often happens in the innovation space is a lag time I believe, on balance between development in the United States and what has taken overseas. And indeed, we know that a key line of effort for China is the theft of intellectual property. And so we can look at the F-22, we can look at the F-35 as key markers of this strategic mm. approach. So I think that uh, if we haven't seen a lot of conversation within this defense space for China on lasers, we'll likely see it uh, in the, in the, uh, the near future. I think uh, the implications uh, and for of of this are also being weighed uh, by by lawmakers uh, and governments around the world, and therefore also the cost effectiveness coming into into focus. Although there are, of course, as you rightly said, there are challenges with um, generating enough energy mm -hmm. that these weapons uh, require. And I believe uh, the U.S. Army uh, has awarded uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, a contract to deliver a 300 kilowatt class solid state laser weapon system. And it's interesting that this is for the army. Uh, this comes first for the army, because I guess this again plays into the challenges of deploying high energy systems at sea. Yeah, I think that's I think that's part of it. But there's also a recognition among defense uh, army leaders that I talk to and key staff uh, as well that we can bring to bear lasers on a stationary compound to protect important communications, staff planning processes. And again, this exempt, this episode that took place in Jordan at Tower 22 is more to the point about where lasers could be helpful in a broader force protection plan that includes both active and passive sort of countermeasures. At the end of the day, for now, for the moment, we are witnessing the deployment or the potential deployment of laser weapons purely for defense and not offense. Um, when their potential for deployment is being uh, reviewed, it's as part of a layered defense system, right? Explain to us how that works. How do they get into a layered defense system? Well, I've done this a little bit over the course of 20 years as an intelligence officer and now a strategist. And so when you take a look at force protection that includes both offensive and defensive capabilities, what drives the alignment of resources uh, for any number of compounds, outposts or whatever is just contextualizing where you're at in terms of anticipated threat, whether it be the most likely course of actions or most dangerous course of actions. And so in the context of US operations in the region, what that may look like is the use of drones by paramilitary groups that are backed by Iran uh, or other sort of actors in the region to include, let's say Yemen uh, with the Houthis. And so if we anticipate that there is a incoming threat of drones, then what you'd like to do is extend as far as you can, as we talked about before, the operational reach of your capabilities. That may look like a shoulder fired missile system. It may look like a stationary um, sort of static uh, missile system uh, at range. Uh, as this thing comes closer to you, this drone in this case, uh, because it may have circumvented uh, a missile, the missile may have malfunctioned due to climatology reasons we have talked about. Maybe you right. have jamming systems, which are more passive, right? That are meant to right. disorient, to, to, to confuse the drone uh, in this case. And then potentially it circumvents that. And then you have to go to traditional SAF or small arms fire from machine guns, uh, which are either operated by a soldier or soldiers uh, if not some sort of stationary remotely controlled capability. And then, you know, lastly would be, you know, final protective fire as it were, were maybe some sort of arresting nets or concrete barriers. 
And so what you ultimately are attempting to do is to scale at range, whether it's radar or the furthest reach of a weapon system, both active or passive, uh, these capabilities. And this is where you get the sort of layered approach for force protection. So lasers, bringing it back to this conversation, would be really important for sort of the close in fight, as it were, uh, in the event that these other systems had failed or you wanted to triangulate fires. Again, the big uh, consideration here are, are, is swap right, the energy that you have to uh, have to power this, and then also that uh, implication for the range of the missiles, uh, sort of, a, or sorry, the, the laser's effective fire. Wow, okay, so um, realistically speaking, what's your expert take? How soon do we see um, laser weapons part of uh, the, the tactics deployed on the battlefield, at least as far as defense is concerned, on the border rather than the battlefield? What's the timeline? Well, I mean, this is a really good question. And of course, I'll throw it back and say, you know, time will tell. But to put a little bit more meat on the bone there, I think there's really a sense of urgency now based upon especially these three soldiers that were killed. This was the first sort of lethal uh, implication of drone use against soldiers uh, in the region, notwithstanding uh, 150 attacks uh, like this over the course of the last several months. Uh, and of course, TBI or traumatic brain injury imposed on soldiers because of the concussion of these these drones crashing. But because of this incident, I think we're really at an inflection point, but also because of what we've seen in Ukraine and the anticipated implications for vulnerability incurred by US forces that will continue to deploy to the, the, uh, the Middle East uh, and, and the other regions across the world. I think it behooves us uh, to do everything we can uh, to include trying to bring up to snuff these lasers or up to speed these lasers uh, to integrate into our force protection. And by the way, uh, the cost exchange ratio is the most important thing I think the report talked about because yeah. it's not just in a low intensity uh, sort of conflict uh, proxy war, which is taking place, if you will, in the region. This will also be an Achilles heel for US forces in a large scale conflict with a near peer adversary, whether in uh, China or in Russia. And so I think we have to do everything that's, uh, that, that, is, that is possible conceivably to bring to bear these sort of asymmetric systems that we can use ourselves, just like the UK uh, British general had talked about. All right, well, um, we're running out of time, but I want to squeeze in this um, a little bit of a forward-looking question. Hmm. And uh, since we're talking about stuff that's coming from the realm of science fiction into the realm of reality, let's look ahead over the horizon, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, look at the possibility of deploying laser weapons in space. There, of course, uh, space is the perfect um, use case for the environment uh, when it comes to deploying laser weapons. There's no atmospheric interference. Um, you'd have excellent uh, beam control. You'd have excellent uh, deployment of energy on the targets. Is the US Space Force already looking at it? What do you think? Yeah, so I think it's a great question, right? Why haven't we done this yet? You know, to be clear that the testing and evaluation is much easier on land, as we've talked about, based upon cost, based upon specialized training, based upon access, right? Uh, I am not an engineer, um, but, you know, having studied this space pretty closely, I think these things uh, are important to understand uh, potentially why we haven't, you know, flipped the paradigm on its head and gone towards space-based laser and testing thereof. I think the reality is, uh, in terms of conjecture, you, have, you, know, you hate to speculate, but knowing the way that the Space Force is designed at this point with different so-called deltas, uh, and there are a variety of these deltas that have really important specific task and purpose to include uh, the protection of our own capabilities, uh, to include aware awareness of space debris, uh, which is a problem yeah. in space, of course, to include problem, the, yes. the importance of intelligence and surveillance from space. It's likely the case that there is testing and fielding that I am unaware of uh, that's classified uh, for, for these lasers. Yeah, well, it would make complete sense to deploy it in space. So, well, we'll have to wait and see. That's uh, it's a fascinating future to look forward to, albeit a little scary, if I may say, but if aliens do attack, we ought to have something to defend ourselves with. Well, I mean, this is a great point you bring up. There are very few people within the security studies landscape that actually focus on planetary defense. Mm -hmm. One of those happens to be a great colleague of mine, a PhD student actually at Cornell University, who I believe 
and I stay this understand the state of literature is really on the cutting edge for understanding what space defense looks like based upon mm -hmm. a shared humanity uh, consideration yeah. of shared humanity. And so from nothing more than sort of a benign, innocuous, shared interest in protecting mm -hmm. our globe, we yeah. often think about an intramural or cooperative approach to, to use uh, laser systems within yeah. space to deflect incoming asteroids, if exactly. not to defeat, you know, some smaller space debris. Yeah, it need not be aliens. It uh, uh, an asteroid that's a kilometer across, and if it makes it through our atmosphere, it could just wipe us out. Well, well, that's right. And so it's actually a funny story that when I introduced uh, this young man Avishai uh, to my wife at Cornell several years ago, I stated to her, kind of tongue in cheek, but actually being truthful, I think Avi's going to save the planet one day. <laughs> so space lasers don't necessarily have to lead to uh, sort of militarization. Of capability in space, they can be used for ostensibly shared interests like preservation of our of our globe. Yeah, absolutely, preservation of life and humanity as we know it. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, wow. this has been a fascinating discussion as always with you. Thank you so much for your time. Let me just pull up your profile on LinkedIn so people can reach out to you there. Please don't spam, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Lushenko. This is him on LinkedIn and on X. Uh, he is at Lushenko Paul. As always, it's been such a pleasure. I look forward to getting you back. There's a lot to talk about, and right. I hope you can find time soon. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and have a great day.